This is the woman that has stood by me for over 40 years. Woo! And I love her now more than then, believe me. God has been good to us, and uh, I'm just so thankful to have this woman in my life and um, for the children that uh, have been the fruit of this relationship and for all the good things God's brought back to us as a result of His faithfulness. Amen? Everybody say, His faithfulness. His faithfulness. He is faithful. I think he's going to share something. So good to be here this morning, and I, I just want to thank you so much. You, you don't know how of a blessing that you have been for us. Um, the last five, five years, there's been some very dark valleys that we have walked through, just as you have. And every time that we would come to Global Presence, we've felt the wonderful presence of the Lord just melting things off of us and doing a work in us. It's only his presence, only the Father's heart. And so I really appreciate that all that he has done in my life. Um, when I was three... My mom and my dad, they separated. My mom was only 15 years old when she had three children. She ran away, and she met my dad, who was in the Army. She just fell in love. Within three years, she had three children. My sister, myself, and my brother. We're only like 15 and 11 months apart, so she had her hands full. After not too long after that, they, um, they separated, and I really didn't see my dad for years. He was just not in my life. And there's times in my life that I thought, oh, I've got a dad that's abandoned me. He's just left. And there's been many times that he, he started his own little family, said a whole complete different family than what we had. And um, through the years, you know, he would once in a while call and say, how are you doing? And I'd say, well, we're doing fine, you know. And uh, in, deep in my heart, I had built up walls because he had abandoned me. If you could look at my life, you would see walls all around me. And then as time got past, when I was about 45 years old, my sister called me up. She says, Vicki, I've heard that dad is not doing well. I've heard he's not doing well. I said, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that, and then changed the subject. She says, Vicki, I really think that we should go and see him. I said, no, I'm not going to go see him. He abandoned me. Why, should I, why would I go to him to see, to, for him to see me? I, I just, but then the Lord began to talk to me. <laughs> he says, Vicki, you really do need to go see him. Because he had changed his life. He had given his life to God. I did not know that. He had given his life to God. His whole life had changed. He loved Jesus. So we made the trip. We, Valerie and I flew and rented a car and went to Mammoth Springs, Arkansas. <laughs> I was a little nervous, but when we walked into his house and I walked into his bedroom, he was in bed because he, had di he was a diabetic and could not walk, he was a wheelchair. And immediately my dad wanted to explain all of the years why he wasn't with me or wasn't in our lives. And I remember putting my hand up, not in disrespect, but just said, no, I really don't want to go there. I really don't want to go to the past. And then he said to me, he said, Vicki, I have always loved you. My father, Vicki, I have always loved you. And if I could see in the spirit world, all those walls all of a sudden became nothing. They were down. I could feel his heart. I was in his presence. I felt the Father's heart. He really, truly did love me. And I didn't, didn't realize that, but he really, truly did love me. And you know, the Father loves us. It doesn't matter where you have come from. And it, maybe you didn't have time to say to your dad that you loved them. I told my dad I loved him, and I began to thank him. All of a sudden, it didn't matter if he wasn't in my life for years. All of a sudden, all that melted away. The Father's heart, and that's what the Father does for us. He's always there. There's dark times that we walk through, and sometimes we may not acknowledge that he's there, but he is there. Every step, he's there in the very darkest of the darkest days that we face. He is there. Corey Ten Boom said, there's no pit that he is not deeper still. He is so good. I love him. I love the Father's heart. I love what this house brings, the Father's heart. And if you have not had the opportunity and say, oh, I didn't have that opportunity to tell my dad I loved him, it's okay. 
There's fathers in this house that can stand in the gap and can say to you, I love you. You mean everything. You are wonderful. He just is in our balcony all the time. I love you. Doesn't matter where you've been. I still love you. And so we have been uh, traveling through the book of Romans in the last number of weeks. And um, we're going to kind of stick in Romans chapter 12 for just a little while here again today. Uh, Steve broke this open again for us last week in, in the first uh, three or four verses and did a wonderful job, uh, was it last week or two weeks ago, maybe it was two weeks ago, in sharing these things from Romans chapter 12. And so as we pursue in them, I want to just bring your attention to Romans chapter 12, verses 4 through 21 is where we're going to focus on. So we've got a lot of territory to cover, and I wanna, want you to stay with me as close as you can, and I'll try to be less confusing, less confusing for you, try to stick to the point, try to get on with it. And as we consider Romans chapter 12, before we even go to those verses, I want you to consider with me 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. Chapter 4, verse 7. In that particular verse, it speaks to my heart personally today, where it says these words. Let me just find them for you from the NIV. Chapter 4, verse 7. But we have this treasure. We have this treasure. Everybody say treasure. What is a treasure? Jesus is the quick answer, and that is correct. <laughs> In a broader sense, what is treasure? It is value. It is other synonyms for treasure. Rare. Precious. Desired. Valuable. Heard something else up front here. What was that? Okay, anything else? Priceless. What was that? Oh, you're just commenting on the comment. Okay, gotcha. It's good. This is good. We, we, everybody say we, we have this treasure. Are you glad you got treasure? Regardless of what that 401k or 503b looks like, you've got treasure. We have this treasure. Of course, Paul is re referring to the beauty of Jesus Christ and all of the promises released from open heavens by Jesus' obedience that have been flowing down upon the body of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ since its inception, still available to you today. We have this treasure. <laughs> it's precious, it's valuable, it's rare. It's costly. Then he goes on and says, this treasure is in earthen vessels. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. NIV says, jars of clay. I think there's another translation out there I don't know exactly which one it is, so I'm not going to tell you which one. You can find it for yourself. It says, we have this treasure in cracked pots. But the point is, we have something very, very special and precious that is placed within this body of ours, this being of ours, that has this rare combination of things to deal with. Romans 12, 1. Living sacrifice. We live in this tension between the sacrifice and the living, where we are constantly dying and bearing in our body the marks of Jesus Christ, but yet I'm alive. We carry this treasure in an earthen vessel. In other words, something that is not as precious. The vessel is not precious. The vessel is not treasure. It's not crystal vessel. It is a clay vessel. It is a, it is what? It's that was the word next coming out of my mouth. Are you a prophet? <laughs> Way to go, bud. You're bud. 
You're a blessed bud. Yes, you are. And so we have this vessel that is made out of clay, and it is made out of the earth. It's imperfect. It has its weaknesses. It has its flaws. It has its mars. And so God is saying, I have put this vessel in earthen, uh, put this treasure in earthen vessels. And just the other day as I was praying into what was going on here for Sunday, the Lord reminded me of, some, of, of an open vision that He gave me while I was driving, uh, that my job is to drive. And it seems like every time I, I'm standing here, the week before, I'm asked to do to stay longer hours. So this week, I, I, I think it was close to 60 hours I put in at my job. And while, while I was there, the Lord gave me an open vision. I saw the, the state of Wisconsin being lifted up like a, sh like a shelf. The whole state of Wisconsin at its boundaries. And as I looked at that instantaneously, immediately I saw the waters of the rivers and lakes ru running off the sides of that elevated state. And immediately my heart said, what is going on? The waters are running off of the state. They're going to run and dissipate into nothing. And immediately I heard an answer from the Holy Spirit. And he said this as clear as I'm talking to you right now. Only those vessels, only those vessels that are designed and aligned in to, according to my plan can sustain and contain what I am about to do. Only those vessels that are aligned and designed according to my plan, can sustain and contain what I'm about to do. I believe that God's got something up His sleeve, and there's something in Romans chapter 12 for us that helps us understand what does it mean to be that kind of vessel. What does it mean to be that kind of earthen vessel that is designed according to His plan, that is aligned according to His plan so that I can carry, sustain, and maintain, and contain what He is about to do in the earth. Are you ready to do that? You do not need to be afraid. You have every reason to be joyful and hopeful because you are not alone. You are not alone. You are not in this by yourself. Christ Jesus is with you, and so are the people in front of you, behind you, and to your left and to your right. You see, you have a place to belong, and truly it is in His presence. Truly it is in His presence where you belong. You belong to Him, I belong to Him, but I also belong to you. I also belong to you. And you belong to us. It is very important for us as people in this hour, when there is attack in the spirit, there's physical manifestations of anger and rage and retaliation and antichrist spirit showing its head, that you have and know and acknowledge that you have a place to belong, where you are not alone. Amen? Look at your neighbor and put your arm out to him and say, you are not alone. See, becoming those vessels means that there should be a vision, but it should be a, a vertical vision and a horizontal vision. It should be a vision that's, that I can see what Jesus is all about. I see what He's doing. I see what the Father is doing through Jesus, and I do what Jesus did. Jesus says in John 5, 19, I do nothing except what I see the Father doing. Is that a good model for success in your life and mine? If it worked for Jesus, do you think it'll work for you and me? I think so. And so there's got to be a vision upward for Jesus and for the Father God. But there also should be the horizontal vision that I keep in my eyesight the people that God has beside me, the people that God has around me, both in the context of this body as well as those that you work with, that you come in contact with in the marketplace. God, help us to be of that kind of... It's a, it's a vessel that has a vision vertically and horizontally. But it's also a vessel and understanding that there's, it's a relational thing. Again, vertically. I have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit comes to me. And Paul said in Corinthians, he said, He is the God of all comfort who, can, who will comfort all those who are in any trouble. 
Yes, he is the God of all comfort. And I have that wonderful relationship with him. But then also there's that horizontal side of my relationship that I walk with people like you where we are able to kind of talk about the dirty stuff, talk about the daily stuff. You know, life is so daily, isn't it? Life is just so daily. You got to do it, get up every morning, you know, and brush those teeth and drink that coffee and eat that breakfast, get up and get dressed. Go, well, probably not in that order. You do that other thing first. But, but you go to work and you do the, do the routine. It's the daily grind. And it's okay to talk about that stuff too, isn't it? So it's okay to talk about the, str the struggle you had at work. It's okay to talk about the trouble you had at, in the neighborhood. Just like yesterday or this morning, we got up and walked out on our porch. What happens? My neighbor's dog starts barking again. I told Vicki, I don't know. You know, we, we've been here for almost 23 years in this house, and I think, I think 19 of those years we've had dogs barking at us. So has anything changed? Yes. The dog keeps barking, but... Talking about it helps me get redemption. Talking about it helps me get victory. Talking about just knowing somebody understands what I'm dealing with. Talking about it just lets me know that people care and I've been, I've, I've been able to say what's on my mind and say what's on my heart and I've been heard. And there's something good about being heard, isn't there? Do you, do you go to prayer and say, God, I hope you hear me? You know God's going to hear you. And that's one of the motivations for going to prayer because you know He will hear you. Praise God. And the same thing is true about our walk together. We need to be people who are heard. Amen? We need to have friendships around us, relationships around us that, that value us as people, value us for who we are in this crazy, earthen, broken vessel. I know we talk about perfection and we talk about all the beauty, beautiful things and the going from glory to glory, and that's all very, very true. But yet at the same time, in the same breath, we deal with the stuff that's in the treads of our shoes. We deal with the stuff that gets between our toes. We deal with the, the thumbs that get smashed. I was working down in my basement just the other day, working on replacing a basement window, and I had to use a convincer. A two-pound hammer, you know, a little mini mall, little square heads, you know. You know what I'm talking about. And I, I said, whoa, I don't want to bang on that. So I went and got myself a small piece of two-by-four. I'll put that up against that piece of wood, and I'll bang on that thing. Let that thing take the beating. You know, that's what Jesus did. He took the beating for you. So I put that piece of wood up there, and I started banging on that thing, trying to get that other thing to line up just properly. Bang! I hit it again. And I thought, this is sure a small piece of wood. I've got to be very careful. All this is happening quickly. Lightning speed in my brain. <laughs> just got to be very careful not to hit that thumb. <laughs> and just as soon as I said that, Jason, I told you this last week, that thumb got hit. And that's a small, small mark compared to the way it was about eight days ago. <laughs> but you see, that thumb was a small, you compare the size of that thumb to the size of this body pretty small. But that little thumb affected this whole body. What happened here was reflected here and here and here and here in every way. About You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Because this thumb is a part of this body, small as it might be. And then the Lord began to speak to me, you know, five-fold ministry. Fivefold ministry. The thumb is symbolic of the apostolic ministry. Why do we say that? Well, because the apostolic ministry, in my heart, my understanding, has the greatest authority. Why? Because he's servant of all. He or she is servant of all. He that is greatest among you, let him be what? Servant of all. And so the thumb serves, serves the prophet, which is the pointer, serves the the next finger, which is the longest one, which is the evangelistic, and then he serves the, the, the ring finger, which is pastoral, and the little finger that gets to the jots and the tittles is the teacher. And so the, the, pro, the apostle serves all of the other four. And as I was considering that, I thought, Lord, there's apostles that need prayer right now in Jesus' name. You see, when, when the apostolic is, in, is functioning in its place and functioning properly, what happens? Great manipulation, great dexterity. And I say manipulation in a good way. 
because we're able to manipulate things, grab things, pick things up, and move things around because fivefold is working and helping the other four gifts. Praise God. And so, you see, God is telling us today that there is something about being in the body of Christ that we are able to acknowledge we have weaknesses. We have, I'm doing that purposely, we have areas of our life that just aren't perfected yet, that the Holy Spirit's still working on. And sometimes the direct voice of the Holy Spirit is just quiet or steely silent until I sit down with someone else and we are able to open our hearts to each other and suddenly through your voice, through your tenderness, through your willingness, through your, the prophetic anointing upon you, I start to hear the Holy Spirit once again, not in an instructing way or an incorrecting, a correcting way, but in an uplifting, affirming way that everything's going to be okay. Now, I really feel that's a powerful word for this house right now. I want you to turn to somebody and tell them everything is going to be okay. Turn to two people and tell them that. Everything is going to be okay. You see, we, <laughs> we spend time together in worship and prayer, and I'm very thankful for that. And it's very necessary for us to have times of worship and prayer. Uh, last Sunday morning, as we were getting ready to pray before service, Mark, Mark Fredenberg said, mentioned something about recalibrating, and it, and it brought brought something to my mind. I have a Galaxy uh, 5, an S5, is that what you call it, Galaxy S5 phone? Some of you iPhone people don't even know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> but I have a Galaxy 5 phone, and every once in a while, this crazy GPS will come up, it'll interrupt what I'm trying to get done, and it'll say, we need to recalibrate your compass. And then it shows a diagram on the phone. Have you ever seen that, any Galaxy owners? You've seen it? Yeah. And it shows the picture of the phone. It says, you're supposed to do this with your phone. <laughs> and I have no idea. I don't understand the mechanism of that. What's it ha happening? Must be some kind of voyance, whether it's clear or not, I don't know. <laughs> but there's an alignment happening as, you, as this thing goes on. And I was thinking, God, that's exactly what we do when we worship you. Trying to find true north. Oh, God. <laughs> Oh God. oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. You know, we're recalibrating, getting things just back on zero. You know, someone just read something. I think it was Vicky read something to me. I don't know. It was about men. If there's one area where men lie repeatedly, it's on the zero setting on the scale. <laughs> They recalibrate that to start at negative five. So that when you step on, you're not 215. It shows only 210. <laughs> but you see, we just need to recalibrate and say, this is what we're all about. Yes, we're spiritual people having a physical experience. But that physical experience is just as real as the spiritual dimension that we walk in on a regular basis. Amen? Amen. That practical stuff. That crazy stuff. Praise God. Jesus, in John chapter 17, he prayed. He, said, he prayed to the Father. He says, I pray that they would be one as we are one. We are one. It's interesting that I don't know. I, I'm just going to leap out here and say, that is quite different from a prayer of unity. Quite often I hear people citing John 17 as a prayer for unity. And it is in a way, but Jesus didn't say he prayed for unity. He prayed that we would be one as he is one. You see, what happens is sometimes we try to, we push unity. We push unity like trying to put a bunch of square blocks into a, into a, into a balloon and have a round balloon. It's not going to happen. We just kind of push unity, push unity, push unity, and we all are not one yet. But you see, when we become one with Jesus Christ, all of a sudden, he begins to morph us from the inside out, doesn't he? We change from our, our, our outer man, our, 
our physical weaknesses and all of our temperamental issues and all that stuff. And before long, the Holy Spirit, through the righteousness of Jesus Christ, begins to condition us and take off our, round, our rough edges to make us round once again so that we can truly have unity. But seeking unity before we are one with Him is a futile exercise in the flesh. I've seen it happen in community after community where we seek to have unity, unity, unity. And it's all a good cause. It's all, it sounds great, but how does it happen? It happens when we come to Jesus Christ and get cal recalibrated in our understanding of who Jesus is. That He is the Son of God who came to give Himself as a ransom for your sins and mine. He paid the ultimate price of his life for you and for me. And we want to get calibrated to that, recalibrated to that. When Jesus was in the garden the other day, he was, he was praying. He says, Father, if it is possible, if it's possible, what are you saying, Jesus? If it's possible, let this cup pass from me. If if what's possible, Jesus, what are you asking for? If it's possible for every man and woman, if it's possible for human beings to be right with you by their own effort, if it's possible for them to have righteousness by being good and doing things, then let this cup pass from me because I don't want to die. Jesus repeatedly said, I'm struggling with a baptism. In Luke chapter 12, 12, he says, I'm struggling with a baptism to this very day. It causes me a heartache and grief as I look forward to it. You see, Jesus knew that you and I could not be made right with God or have righteousness through our own efforts. So it's not possible, Jesus, for any human being to be righteous before God to be justified by their own effort only through Jesus' sacrifice. Jesus, the sacrifice, the Lamb that we sang about today that takes away the sin of the world. We're recalibrated about who Jesus is and then about what He's done. He's paid the price for me. He, he fulfilled all of the law. Remember a few weeks ago we talked about righteousness? Righteousness 101. Righteousness means obedience to all of the law, all of the time, for all of your life. Who's ever done that? Romans says, oh, there's none righteous, yea, not one. Therefore, Jesus, who came into the world because all have come short of the glory of God, could not measure up. He fulfilled that on our behalf so that we could say, Jesus, you are my righteousness. You are my righteousness. See, he's recalibrating us to become more and more like him so that we can walk together in unity. We can walk together encouraging one another and strengthening one another. Oh, as times get rougher and rougher, <laughs> as things happen in this world, God's going to release a greater anointing upon you and I as we together. One of the greatest things Jesus desired was this word W I. T-H. I have desired, with desire, I have desired to celebrate this with you. He desires to be with you. He longs to be with you in companionship because he knows there's the same desire in your heart of hearts to have someone with you. Aren't you glad he's desiring to be with you? Praise the Lord. And so as we move forward, he's, he's saying, I want to identify and recalibrate you about your inheritance. Luke chapter 12, if you look there real quickly, I don't know if any of these verses have been going up there. I lost track. Has there been? Okay, That's okay, no problem. Luke chapter 12, is a, is a, some have identified that as a teaching on, on greed. And really the whole the whole dialogue got started because someone said to Jesus, can you tell my brother to share the inheritance with me? It was a struggle over inheritance. A struggle over inheritance. Now we have an inheritance in Jesus Christ. And what does it really represent? You see, my inheritance includes everything in the kingdom. It's exceeding, it's abundantly above all that we could ask, think, or imagine. 
He is the desire of the nations. What does that mean? It means that all that, the, all that could be desired by any people anywhere is met in Christ Jesus. He says, ask of me and I will give you the nations. Yes, indeed, I will. You see, the inheritance you and I have is just a question away. Just a question away. He wants to supply all of your needs and my needs. And Jesus goes on in that teaching in Luke chapter 12 and says, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of things possessed. What is he saying? He's saying, no. Life consists in the right things possessed. That if we have the right things of the kingdom of God, which is Jesus Christ and a relationship with Him and a relationship with you and I, how valuable and precious that is. Well, let's go to Romans chapter 12. How you doing out there? Gotten awful quiet on me. Do I need to ask more questions? God is real and he really cares about you. Yeah. And he wants you to, uh, to really be courageous in your relating to one another. As you relate to Jesus Christ, everything is going to be a okay, okay. Everything's gonna be okay. Yes. Years ago, a guy from Tennessee came preaching. Some. This is a long time ago. He came up here, up to our, up to a church we were helping with in Illinois. He says, "Everything's gonna be be okay. Everything's gonna be be all right. Since Jesus came in and saved my soul, everything's gonna be all right." Of course, it's quite a simple little thing, but that's how simple the gospel is. That's how simple this relationship stuff really should be. <laughs> Romans chapter 12. Paul talks here about gifts. He talks about gifts. And I got about 15 minutes. Wow. Romans chapter 12. Paul, the writer of Romans 12, assumes knowledge of gifts. He says in Romans 12, okay, we're going to get to Romans chapter 12. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us in verse 6. Oh, we got to go up a little bit. Verse 4, 5. Just, verse 4. Just as each of us has one, has one body with many members, and these members do not have all the same function, so in Christ, everybody say in Christ. In Christ we are many, we who are many form one body. And each member belongs to all the others. Praise God. Praise God. Each member belongs to all the others. There's a translation called the voice. The voice translation. And it simply says this. It says that together we can do more than we can alone. Isn't it true? By being a body of Christ functioning together, we have the capacity that is enlarged because we are functioning together. Jesus says where two or three are gathered together, there's a third or a fourth. There am I in the midst of you. See, so when we get together, when we have times of interaction, and next Sunday certainly being a, being a, a picnic time is a great time to get to know people a little better, but you know God is asking you to take some time to get to know each other a little better all the time all the time, to know what's percolating in Gavin's heart, to know what's happening in Dennis's heart, to understand what's taking place where you work and what you're dealing with. Those are very, very valuable times, aren't they? Why? Why? Should we be a little bit reluctant about that? Should we be a little bit, a little bit timid about that? No, because this gospel is very durable. This gospel message in the work of Jesus Christ is very, very durable. It can handle any issue. It can handle any problem. It can shovel a lot of coal and push a lot of issues aside. So there's no reason to feel at all a little bit intimidated, a little bit reluctant to get to know each other, to share with people. Open up and crack open those subjects at work by talking with folks and then asking questions that will we'll just kind of... Uh, Begin to open the treasure house that's inside their earthen vessel. Begin to know who they are. And so let's go to Romans chapter 12 a little bit further. So we are members together. We are members together. 
But then he goes on and he says this, that we also have gifts differing. So he says, what gifts are those? Well, they're prophecy. We have different gifts according to the grace given to us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it's teaching, let him teach. If it's encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Now, in that little context, Paul is assuming that you know what that gift is and how it works. You see, it really is important here that, that, God's, that, that I'm using my gifting. You know, if, I, if I'm really a fast runner or if I'm really a strong man like Corey Rake, is Corey here? Is he? Oh, okay. There he is. I told Corey some time ago, I saw him come through the door. I said, Corey, if I fill the shirt like you fill a shirt, I don't know what I'd do. <laughs> I mean to tell you, that guy's got ripples on top of ripples. He's got, he's got, he doesn't have guns. He's got, he's got howitzers. <laughs> you know, praise God. Hallelujah. So build up your body. How do you know if you're strong if you haven't lifted weight? How do you know you're fast if you haven't run in a race? How do you know you have pr prophetic anointing if you've never really exercised it? So the, Paul is encouraging you and I to be activated, to walk in these things, and to experiment with them and just exercise them and watch for fruitfulness that comes upon us. And he tells us in a practical way, if it is prophesying, if it is prophecy, then prophesy in the portion of faith, up to your portion of faith. Whatever your, whatever your faith uh, begins to um, release in your heart, begin to use the gift of prophecy to edify, exhort, and to build up and to comfort. Or if it's ministry, use it in your ministering. It means simply, <laughs> whatever your, your hands are finding to do, do it as a servant. Do it, do it, do it. See, this is, this is the type of motivation that, that each of us have maybe a different motivational understanding or something that really causes the wheels to begin to spin in our heart. I'm really ex excited for Justin over here as he's doing the, the treasure hunting. It seems like something's begin to really percolate over there, and, and he finds that easy to do. And see, that's kind of how the spiritual gifting should begin to work within us. We find out what really works well and what just seems to be like a natural outflow of my life and begin to move with that. You see, that's where you can identify the anointing of God in your life is if it comes as just like it's, it just pops out of me. It just kind of oozes like oil out of my skin. And, and so allow these things to begin to, to formulate in your life. And so he goes on and says, if it's teaching, if, if it, he who teaches, let him do it in teaching. If he who exhorts, let it be in exhortation. He who gives, let it be with liberality. And he who leads, let it be with diligence. And he who shows mercy, let him do it with cheerfulness. Praise God. Cheerfulness. You can tell someone's showing you mercy if they're cheerful with you. They're kind of quiet reserved. No mercy. Mercy typically has a cheerfulness edge to it. Like, hey, <laughs> we're buds. We're friends. You see, God is, God is so gracious to us because in Romans 11, as he talks about the Jewish nation that had gone into disobedience, and as a result of their disobedience, our blessing came to us. He goes on in that same chapter, and he says, God has, he has bound all men, one version says, or turned us all over to disobedience. All are subject to disobedience. All are subject to disobedience. Why does he do that? And the verse says in Romans eleven thirty two, so that he may show mercy. See, God delights in showing mercy. He's eager to forgive. He's eager to bring restoration into your life. He's, he's just so willing. He's cheerful about it. 
As Jesus was enduring the cross, there was joy set before him. He's saying, I get to show mercy and mercy and mercy and mercy and mercy and love and love and love. And people are going to respond. Lives will be changed as a result of these things. Well, let's go on. I, I uh, want to shift real quickly here to the behaviors and behaving like a Christian. <laughs> you see... As we started out here today, God was saying, what kind of container, how can we be aligned? How can we be that container that will contain and maintain? I've got so many things I could share with you, and I, I don't say that in any other reason than to say I've got way much stuff. But to, together, the Lord is saying, here, look at ch chapter 12, verse 9. You're going to live this life on the practical side, the horizontal dimension. Let love be without hypocrisy. There's a translation called The Voice that I've been enjoying lately. And it says this in verse 9, Let love others well and don't hide behind a mask. Love authentically. Paul says further in that same verse, he says, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. The voice says, despise evil and pursue what is good as if your life depends on it. <laughs> Verse 20, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor, giving preference to one another. There's some good counsel. The voice says, live in true devotion to one another, loving each other as sisters and brothers. Be first to honor others by putting them first. There's some powerful truth in that, isn't there? This culture of honor that we want, it doesn't happen automatically. You know that? Culture doesn't happen just automatically. I mean, culture of honor doesn't happen. Culture happens automatically, but a culture of honor doesn't happen automatically. It is something that is purposefully done purposefully, things that we, we, we just must disciple ourselves into. You know what I'm saying? So these verses 9 through 21, you know, if there's a way that you and I can disciple ourselves to make ourselves better, stronger, more equipped, or those kinds of vessels, those kinds of containers that are aligned and designed according to His plan to be able to contain what I'm about to do in this land, then we must do some, some self-discipline and dis discipling of ourselves, some, some of these decisions that we make. You know, it gets right down to our thoughts and our decisions, doesn't it? Holy Spirit, thank you for your help. We couldn't do this without you. And Holy Spirit says, thank you for partnering with me. Thank you for partnering with me. I will always do my part. I will always fulfill my role. And he says, I just ask you to do, your, do the same and disciple yourself. Disciples, and that's kind of what these verses are talking about. It's about some choices that we make, really, choices that we make. And so he goes on and says, be kindly affectioned, live in true devotion to one another, loving each other as sisters and brothers, and be first to honor others by putting them first. Someone one time said, only what happens in us can happen through us. There's some joy that we get. There's some additional increase of anointing that happens when we begin to release our experience. Who's seen a good movie lately? Seen a good movie? Yeah? Did you tell anybody about it? Yeah. Why? Because it was good. You see, the things that happen to us usually happen through us. When something good happens to us and when we tell about it, it's like, wow, I relived that moment all over again. You see, in 1 John chapter 1, verse 4, I, we're jumping all over the place, but Holy Spirit's putting this all together. I just know He is. He's just putting this all together. 1 John says, That which was from the beginning, which we heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. Verse 3, we proclaim to you what we have seen and what we have heard so that you may have fellowship with us. 
so that we can be on the same page, yes. And our fellowship is with the Father. Our fellowship, yours and mine, ours together, is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. And verse 4, we write this to make our joy complete. See, there's some value about me, value back to me, for releasing what's happened inside of me. John says, I'm writing this to you so that my joy can be complete. Because there's some value that comes back to me about being a member of the body. Ephesians, oh. Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 16. He says, we are fitly framed together. And we are formed in the image of Christ. But he says, as the Holy Spirit supplies, he says, we are compacted together and held together by that which every joint, the New Testament in the New King James says, that which every joint supplies. That which every joint. What's a joint? All right, I'm not asking for a stoner's response. But a joint is what? It's something that bends, yeah. It's a connection point. It's two, where two members come together. And he goes on in, in, in verse 16, he says, by that which every joint supplies. Now, we know and acknowledge that God Himself, Father of glory, through Jesus Christ and the workings of the Holy Spirit, is our source of supply. But Paul is telling us that there is something that when two members get together under the glory cloud, in the righteousness of Christ, with the intention of the kingdom as their focus. When members get together at the joints, that joint can supply something that nothing else can supply. Holy Spirit will bring anointing. Holy Spirit will bring supply. Hudson Taylor, a a wonderful missionary to mainland China. I read his biography years ago and just struck, it just struck my life as he sacrificed his life and his ministry and his family. He was in, so involved in mainland China for the, for the salvation of the Chinese. And he said something, and I think it was even uh, Che An quoted it Friday night. He said, God's work done God's way will never lack for God's supply. And I believe that's true. God's work done God's way will never lack for God's supply. That's true corporately. It's true personally as well. As I follow God, as I listen to His instruction, as I obey His voice, as I do His will, as I I live this righteous life and understand that I have the very nature of Christ inside of me, what I couldn't do before I now can, what I didn't want to do before now I do want to. Why? Because I'm not who I used to be. I now can do what he wants me to do. Praise God. And so he supplies and will supply. But there is something, folks, about this connectedness. There's something about this relationship stuff. Oh, this is so much better. I can see your faces. Sometimes you just got to come out of the light. Not, you know what I'm saying, you know, out of the brilliance of things. To see the common things. This is one of the reasons why I like working a secular job. Because it allows me to step out of some things and step into some other things. Where I begin to see things that I would not have seen before. You have that privilege every single day to worship God, to be in devotion, to sing and praise and worship God wherever you go, but yet to be in the fray and to connect. Connect. Where members of the body begin to relate to each other. And believe me, brothers and sisters, you know that it's it's difficult to put a descriptive to it, but Paul says there's something that is supplied when members come together. 
It, it, it ministers to the body. Something is brought into the fellowship when men and women begin to relate to one another in love and honor and respect for each other and encouragement and love and trust. Amen? Just you stand to your feet with me real quickly? I had the privilege last night with Vicki to listen to a portion of that conference, the Leadership Conference, and bless Steve and Renee as they go and are coming back, uh, that their anointing and their, their spirits, their, their inner man will be rejuvenated to carry on and go forward and begin to push, 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 and begin to ignite fires. God is calling you and I to walk in agreement today, isn't he? Psalm 133 says, Behold how good... And how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, running down the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down to the edge of his garments. It is like the dew of Hermon, descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there, 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 there the Lord commands the blessing. Where? When brothers and sisters dwell together, how pleasant, how wonderful, how good, how beautiful to dwell together in unity and harmony. He says, that's where I'm going to command the blessing. See, Abraham, by faith, who's our great model, all the way from the Old Testament, walked by faith. And as a result, God's promise to him was, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you. And you will be a blessing. The Lord gives you that same promise today. I am going to bless you. Not because you work so hard. Put that away. Do away with that. Self-effort can't get it done. The work of Jesus has gotten it done. Put faith in what Jesus has done for you and watch him transform your vision for your own life vertically and horizontally. Watch the Holy Spirit begin to minister to you about your purpose in life vertically and horizontally, about your relationships vertically and horizontally as you just simply trust the work of Jesus Christ. As we come to that blessing, the Lord says, this is where I command the blessing. When we come together knowing that I don't have to look to Dan to give me kudos to make me feel good Sunday morning. Thank God I love Dan. And Dan doesn't depend upon me to give him kudos on Sunday morning to make him feel good. Why? Well, it's nice that we do that. But internally, we have come to this conclusion that everything is okay right here with Jesus Christ. That I am who he says I am that he has done what he said he would do, and I have what he says he would give me. I have righteousness that is pure and holy. I have been recreated in his image after that very righteousness, and I am able to live this life to its fullest so that the world may know that we are his people, so that the people you interact with out there in the shadows, where you're able to see the reality of life, you're able to know I can bring light and glory and blessing. Together we're connected. Together we're connected. Together that brings a supply of some resource that just puts fire in my bosom. It makes me want to say I'll stand up and defend you to the end. Because you know me and I know you. Praise God. And together we are more than we are separate your hands with me, Jesus. You've done a mighty work in coming to this world. You've just released all of the strength of heaven upon this earth by your obedience to the law. How you obeyed every, every aspect of the law and then you also bore 
all of the hatred and the punishment for disobedience to the law. You covered both sides of that law, both its obedience as well as carrying its disobedience. The way you were beaten, the way you were slapped, the way you, you, were, you, were, you were shoved and, and, and uh, thorns and, and spears put into you and nails into you. You bore the horrific nature of disobedience for us. What a load you carried, what a work you've done all to create a way for us to come boldly before the Father. All for us together to come into unity with each other, into a, this oneness with Christ Jesus that I have all that I need in my inheritance in Jesus Christ. I am sufficient in Christ Jesus. And out of that wholeness comes overwhelming abundance. And out of that abundance comes overflow. That's the overflow I seek, Lord, for us in relationship. That's the overflow that I seek. That's the overflow that I seek, that we can support and love and nurture and encourage one another in our daily walk. Sean Boltz concluded his message just the other day. He said, remember this equation. Love plus your name or your personal pronoun. Love plus Mark equals prophetic power. Love plus Hannah equals prophetic power. Love plus Pam equals prophetic power. You see, the truth is that God so loved the world Think about this. I want to make this. I, I have permission to make this personal because I heard it with my own word, ears just last night. God so loved the world. Say that with me. God so loved the world that he sent me. Some of you are going to have a hard time saying that. God so loved the world that He sent me. And I'm only here because He first sent His Son. And He paid the price. And He did the work. And He broke the chains. And He brings vast supply. Now, on the receiving and recipient end of that, as the Son of God, as a Son of God, as a Son of God, as a daughter of the Lord, God continues to so love the world. He sends you. Father, we just pray an anointing of love upon this house. Anointing of love in three, four dimensions. One for you. Two for ourselves. Three for those in this company. And four for those that are in the world. Four dimensional love. Release it upon this house today. That we never stray from that. For the prophetic anointing is resting upon you. And God wants his love to be demonstrated through your relationships, through the very person and gift that you are.